Good day everyone, this is Dr. Soper here, and today I'll be discussing the fifth topic in our series of lessons on information privacy and security, with today's topic focusing on illicit data interception and access. To begin, I would like to talk briefly about the relationship between technological complexity and information security. The past few decades have witnessed extraordinary advancements in the development of information and communication technologies, and these advancements have endowed human beings with an ever-growing and ever-expanding set of capabilities. These information and communication technologies not only support human beings as we carry out our tasks, but are increasingly performing tasks automatically on our behalf. As our technologies advance, it is important to realize that so too does the complexity of our technological devices and technological infrastructure. From a practical perspective, this means that people have more technological options and products from which to select, and over time, such products provide more and more capabilities. From a technical perspective, however, this means that our hardware devices, software programs, and communications networks are also becoming more complex. Even a low-cost modern computer, for example, is many, many orders of magnitude more complex than the earliest programmable digital computers that were built in the 1940s. Not only is an increasingly complex technological world more challenging for individuals and organizations to navigate and manage, but from the perspective of information security, it also provides attackers with more and more opportunities to cause harm. One of the ways in which malicious parties can cause harm to information assets is by illicitly intercepting data while they are in transit and one of the commonest methods of carrying out such illicit data interception is by means of a man-in-the-middle attack. When interacting with a computer device, many people feel that information is safe while it is in transit between themselves and the application programs that they are using. In reality, however, there are many ways in which a malicious party can illicitly intercept or modify data while they are in transit between a user and an application program, or between a user or application program and a data repository. A man-in-the-middle attack, then, is a type of information security attack in which a malicious program is inserted between two other programs, or between a user and a program, for the purpose of capturing or modifying data that are in transit. As an example, a malicious program might be designed to capture sensitive information such as login credentials or credit card numbers as they pass between a user and her web browser. These man-in-the-middle attacks are conceptually very similar to wiretapping insofar as input and or output data can be intercepted by the malicious program without the knowledge of the user or the compromised system. From an information security perspective, one of the characteristics of man-in-the-middle attacks that makes them particularly troublesome is that such attacks can be accomplished either with or without physical access to the target device. One of the commonest ways in which man-in-the-middle attacks are carried out is through the use of a keystroke logger. A keystroke logger is a type of man-in-the-middle attack in which a malicious software program or a standalone device which contains an embedded malicious program is used to surreptitiously record keystrokes on a target computing device. Occasionally, keystroke loggers will record all of the keystrokes that pass between the user's keyboard and the compromised machine, but it is commoner for a keystroke logger to be linked to a particular application program or type of program. A keystroke logger, for example, 
might be designed to run as a background service on the user's computer and monitor which application programs are being used. When a target application program, such as a web browser or an email client, becomes the active window, the keystroke logger will then begin recording user keystrokes. The keystrokes that have been recorded by a keystroke logger may be stored locally in a log file on the compromised machine for later retrieval, or they may be secretly transmitted to a remote destination by means of a network connection. Once the malicious party who planted the keystroke logger acquires the keystroke log, then the log can be analyzed in an effort to find sensitive information such as usernames, passwords, credit card numbers, and so forth. Although the specific implications of illicit data interception will vary from case to case, broadly speaking, the illicit interception of data compromises the confidentiality and integrity of the affected information system. One useful way of thinking about the implications of illicit data interception is to consider what sort of benefits and injuries accrue and to whom as the result of such an information security breach. From the perspective of benefits or gains, illicit data interception is intended to benefit the intercepting party in some way. Whether and to what extent the intercepting party actually benefits from the illicit data interception depends upon the nature of the intercepted data. If, for example, a keystroke logger is used in an effort to capture sensitive information, but the user never actually types any sensitive information, then the secretly captured keystrokes will be of little value. From the perspective of injury, Illicit data interception can potentially cause both direct and indirect harm. First, direct harm can be caused to the party whose data or information was compromised. If, for example, an attacker illicitly intercepted your bank account information, you might suffer direct financial harm as a result. It is also possible, however, for illicit data interception to cause indirect harm as well. An organization, for example, might see its reputation suffer, or customer perceptions of the organization's competency or trustworthiness might decline subsequent to a successful illicit data interception attack. Publicly traded companies are very aware of the fact that the market punishes breaches of information security, and for this reason, many of these companies prefer not to inform their customers or the public when such a breach occurs. With all of the attention that is paid to mechanisms such as encryption and firewalls in the information security world, many people often forget that physical access to information technology hardware or devices also represents a substantial and very real security vulnerability. Put simply, Without the use of physical access controls such as locked doors, security guards, and so forth, a hardware device has no real, tangible security boundary. If an unauthorized party is able to gain physical access to a hardware device, then she might be able to cause harm in a number of ways. First, a malicious party might be able to read, modify, or destroy sensitive data on a physically unprotected device. Second, a malicious party may be able to easily introduce malicious code or malware onto a physically unprotected device. Third, a malicious party might simply steal an unprotected device or cause physical damage to its hardware components. As organizations and individuals adopt cloud computing, the result is that data are being increasingly centralized in a relatively small number of physical locations, such as shared data centers. From the perspective of vulnerabilities associated with physical access, this consolidation of data represents a sizable increase in risk for society. A single physical access breach, for example, now has the potential to compromise the confidentiality, integrity, 
or availability of many individuals or organizations information assets. To engender trust and as a method of combating this increased risk due to consolidation, major data centers are gradually adopting multi-factor authentication to control physical access threats. As with other types of information security attacks, a malicious party wishing to perpetrate a physical attack on an information system requires method, opportunity, and motive. With respect to method, an attacker needs the requisite skills or tools to carry out the attack. Opportunity is also critical insofar as an attacker must have some means of gaining physical access to the information system that she wishes to attack. Finally, a potential attacker will not perpetrate a physical attack on an information system if she has no motive for doing so. That is, an attacker needs a reason to carry out a physical attack, with the reason usually taking the form of some sort of benefit for the attacker. One of the interesting characteristics of physical attacks on information systems is that physically attacking a system poses a comparatively high risk to the attacker. By contrast, a malicious party who conducts an attack on a system from a remote location has a much smaller chance of being caught and apprehended during the commission of the attack itself. In fact, the extremely low probability of being caught and punished when perpetrating a remote attack on an information system is one of the primary reasons that so many individuals are willing to engage in such malicious activities. Since human beings are a necessary component of most information systems, social engineering has been a threat to system security since the dawn of the information age. More broadly, however, Social engineering has been a known threat to information security since the dawn of civilization. One ancient example of social engineering is related in the 3,000-year-old Judeo-Christian story of Samson and Delilah. In the story, Samson makes a vow to his god that he will never cut his hair, and in return for this sign of devotion, Samson's god makes him the strongest man on earth. Samson then wields great power and influence, and his enemies bribe a beautiful woman named Delilah to learn the secret of Samson's strength. Using sweet words and her feminine charms, Delilah is finally able to get Samson to reveal that his long hair is the source of his strength. When Samson falls asleep, Delilah has his hair cut off, thus robbing Samson of his great strength. Samson is then captured by his enemies, who proceed to bind him, poke out his eyes, and throw him in prison, where he must mercilessly toil grinding grain. The lesson in this ancient story is clear. Human beings can be manipulated to reveal sensitive information. More specifically, human psychological characteristics can create or amplify information security vulnerabilities. Human beings are social animals, and as such, we are naturally trusting and generally want to be helpful and courteous to others. Further, we generally presume the activities of others to be innocent in nature. Social engineering, then, is a method of attack in which the attacker takes advantage of these human psychological traits by using personal interactions and social skills in order to acquire sensitive, security-related information. In the modern era, social engineering is often carried out by means of impersonation. As an example, an attacker might call a company's system administrator claiming that she is one of the company's executives and that she has forgotten her new password. If the attacker is sufficiently convincing in her impersonation, she may be able to get the system administrator to reset the executive's password and tell her the new password over the telephone. The attacker would then have executive level access to the company's information systems. Remember, sensitive information might be protected by the strongest security mechanisms in the world, 
But those mechanisms are useless if someone who has legitimate access to the information can be persuaded to share it with a malicious party. Our earlier discussion on social engineering highlighted the dangers that are posed to system security by insiders. Many organizations develop information security strategies that focus on the establishment of a perimeter defense with the goal of preventing attacks from outsiders. Such strategies, however, ignore insiders, that is, the people who work inside the organization. Since information systems typically involve people in some way, insiders are a necessary part of most information systems. From the perspective of information security, it is critical to remember that insiders are also vulnerabilities. In comparison to outsiders, insiders commonly require, and are therefore granted, more privileges and greater access to system capabilities. This legitimate access to information assets and system resources makes insiders obvious targets for psychological attacks, such as social engineering attacks. Regardless of whether their intentions are malicious or benign, when insiders behave in a manner that is inconsistent with established security protocols, that behavior has the potential to cause great harm to an information system and to the organization that the system supports. When an information security incident takes place, it may be necessary to investigate the incident in detail, and for this purpose an organization might rely on computer forensics. Computer forensics is a branch of digital forensic science that is primarily concerned with establishing the facts as they relate to an information security incident. When an information security breach occurs, the victim or victims, or government officials such as intelligence officers or judicial prosecutors, may employ computer forensic scientists to investigate the incident and gather evidence. In the process of investigating an information security breach, computer forensic scientists seek to establish facts that can answer specific questions. Examples of these questions include, how did the breach occur? What is the nature of the harm that was caused by the breach? Or, who was responsible for the breach? Facts that are revealed by computer forensic scientists in the process of performing their forensic analyses are often used as the basis for establishing legal guilt or innocence in a court of law. The use of computer forensics has grown markedly in the past few decades and is now used regularly by government investigators and large organizations alike. Computer forensics is especially common in situations involving a sophisticated information security attack or an attack by insiders who often go to great lengths to hide or destroy evidence of their malicious activities. One of the ways in which organizations and system developers have endeavored to prevent illicit access to data is by adopting a strategy based on obscurity, that is, protecting sensitive information by keeping the information hidden or secret. Security through obscurity, then, is an information security philosophy predicated on the belief that a system can remain secure if information about its internal mechanisms is not divulged. A developer, for example, might employ this strategy by embedding the username and password for a database inside her source code, thinking that the username and password will be safe after the program is compiled. Another example of the security through obscurity philosophy is the all-none file protection that was a hallmark of early IBM operating systems. In the all-none approach, access to a file required the user to know the name of the file. Since the operating system would not allow a user to generate a list of the files contained on the machine, not knowing the name of a file was considered a security barrier. In the modern era, most security experts agree that seeking to achieve security through obscurity is a poor strategy. 
elements of an information system that are meant to be kept secret or hidden will usually be revealed in the long run. And in the age of the internet, knowledge about such secret or hidden system components can spread around the globe almost instantly. The security of an information system must therefore not depend upon secrecy alone. Securing an information system against illicit data access requires not only physical access controls, but the use of strong authentication methods as well. Currently, the commonest way in which systems authenticate users is through the use of a password. This is risky because passwords can be easily shared, and an information system has no way of knowing whether the person who supplies a correct username and password is actually the real-world human being to whom those credentials belong. One of the ways of limiting the risk associated with the password authentication paradigm is to use passwords that change often. As an example, a system might employ a one-time password approach in which a user's password only allows access to the system once, after which the user will need to obtain a new password. Synchronous security tokens are one method of enabling a one-time password approach that minimizes frustration for the user. A synchronous token is a small physical device that contains a digital clock which is synchronized with the system clock. Using the current time and a secret algorithm, both the system and the synchronous token change the current password for a user on a frequent basis. For example, once per minute, thus strengthening the authentication protocol. Another approach to implementing dynamic passwords is through the use of a challenge response system. In a challenge response system, the user memorizes a simple formula or algorithm. When she attempts to sign into the system, the system will randomly generate a challenge value, such as a short number. The user must then apply her simple formula or algorithm to the challenge value in order to generate the correct response value. The response value, which was derived from the randomly generated challenge value, is then used as the one-time password. A more sophisticated version of this approach can be implemented using response generating tokens, which are small physical devices that embed a mathematically sophisticated formula that is unique to each user. When the user attempts to sign into the system, the system will generate a challenge value which the user then enters into the response generating token. The token then generates the response value which serves as a one-time password. System authentication can be further strengthened through the adoption of a continuous authentication paradigm. Continuous authentication systems require users to authenticate themselves frequently and on an ongoing basis while interacting with the system. One way to do this is to ask users to re-enter their passwords on a regular basis, for example, once every five minutes. Such an approach can understandably be frustrating for users, and as such, biometric devices might be used instead. As an example, a system might use facial recognition-based authentication, such that a small camera continuously verifies whether the person sitting in front of a computer screen is actually an authorized user. Although continuous authentication can prove cumbersome or frustrating in the context of human users, such psychological factors do not apply in the context of machine-to-machine -machine interactions. For the purpose of machine-to-machine -machine interactions, it is therefore good practice for each machine to authenticate itself to the other at the outset of every single transaction. One of the most powerful tools that information security personnel can use to prevent illicit data access is to adopt a least privilege model. The principle of least privilege states that users of an information system should be granted the fewest rights and privileges possible. Only those privileges that are necessary 
for a user to do her job should be granted. Further, user rights and privileges should be monitored on an ongoing basis in order to allow unused rights and privileges to be identified. System rights and privileges that are not being used should be revoked in order to strengthen system security. There are at least four reasons why organizations should adopt a least privileged model of information security. First, adopting a least privileged model can prevent up to 90% of malicious code attacks. Second, adopting a least privileged model makes it much more difficult for malicious code to impact critical elements of a system. Third, adopting a least privileged model prevents non-administrator users from installing unknown or unauthorized application programs which might compromise system security. Finally, and importantly, adopting a least privilege model allows an organization's security personnel to focus their efforts on fewer points of attack. If, for example, only administrative level users are allowed to install or modify application programs, then the information security team will not need to burden itself by monitoring whether non-administrators are installing or modifying application programs. Well, my friends, thus ends our overview of illicit data interception and access. I hope that you learned something interesting in this lesson, and until next time, have a great day.